Underneath the complicated mechanics of Injustice 2 lie the mind games that players engage in during each fight. Mind games are essentially attempts at predicting your opponent's actions and acting accordingly, all while keeping your own actions as cryptic and unpredictable as possible. Conditioning is a serious part of these mind games. The act of conditioning can be either a short or a long process, taking as long as one mistake or an entire game. Conditioning takes place when you punish your opponent for acting one way, enough times to where they'll act the way you want them to. An example of conditioning is punishing an unsafe move. We've all come across a Batman player online who'll do this. And this is perfectly acceptable behavior. He can play Batman and spam the slide however much he wants. You, as the opponent, have to condition him. You have to teach him, no, that's not okay, and you're going to eat a lot of damage for that mistake. You have to give him a reason to stop doing the slide. So block and punish. He'll learn eventually that you're going to blow him up each time he does an unsafe slide. Another way to condition your opponent is to get them to block in a certain direction. Set your Sub-Zero and perform 2-2 on them, leaving them in a standing reset situation. From here, you can either do a forward 3 or a back 1, an overhead or a low. Granted, this is a little reactable, but still. If you do the overhead 10 times in a row, your opponent will be inclined to block overhead, and that's when you do the low instead, after conditioning your opponent to block overhead. This can create some deep mind games mid-game, like, well, he's done the overhead twice now, is he going to go for a low? Or does he think that I'm going to go for the low and he's actually going to go for an overhead? Both of these answers are no, and you're going to walk up and throw them. In all seriousness, though, conditioning is an ongoing process you need to be aware of when fighting. And now we move on to footsies. Footsies have become almost a joke among the community now, due to the common belief that so many gimmicks exist in NRS games that have negated the purpose of footsies. This is simply untrue. Footsies is a concept where you control space and respect your opponent's space control simultaneously taking advantage of both. Scarecrow is arguably the best footsie character in the game, so I'll use him as an example. The Deadshot knows that Scarecrow's forward 2 reaches this far, and is going to pick a distance just outside the forward 2 reach to start his projectile offense. He knows that when Scarecrow goes for the forward 2, it'll whiff, and Deadshot can punish him for it. Footsies. Outspacing your opponent and baiting them into making mistakes. It's an ongoing process in a match just like conditioning. You have to know your opponent's footsie capabilities before going into the match so you have an idea of how to adjust your own footsies to adapt accordingly. Hit confirmation is one thing that separates an experienced player from a beginner. Hit confirmation is determining whether to cancel into a specific special move based upon whether the move is hit or blocked. For example, on Scarecrow, if I'm at a range and attempt to out-footsie my opponent with my forward 1-3 string, I have to be able to react whether or not my string was hit or blocked. Because if I cancel into my fear toxin, that's unsafe on block, and I can be punished for it. Instead, if I hit confirm, I see that the move is blocked, and I instead cancel into sickle swing and step backwards as I'm doing it to make myself safe. If the move were to hit, I cancel into Fear Toxin for the damage and the combo potential. And if the move was blocked, I cancel into the Sickle Swing. Hit Confirmation takes practice and some strings are easier to hit confirm than others. To practice this, pick any string you'd like to learn how to hit confirm and go into practice mode. Set your AI's block pattern to random and hit them with the string. If they block it, go with the blocked option, and if they hit, go with the hit option. Next on the list of fundamentals, we have Reads and Reactions arguably the most difficult fundamentals to master. A read is when you successfully predict an opponent's move based on past behavior. Say you're up against Cyborg and he's done his wake up every single time you've knocked him down. On the next time you've knocked him down, you can read that he'll wake up. So to counter this, do a neutral jump and his wake up will carry him right beneath you, opening him up for a full combo punish. You've successfully read Cyborg's wake up and punished him accordingly. Then we have reactions, which take only experience. Reactions are pretty self-explanatory. See your opponent do a move and react to it, countering them or escaping whatever situation you would have found yourself in. Something any beginner should learn how to react to are teleports in this game. Darkseid, Supergirl, Scarecrow, and Black Mantis teleports can all be reacted to and punished accordingly. This is a good place to start sharpening your reactions and attuning your reflexes for any future fights. Then we have an option select, abbreviated as an OS. You may often hear a slang term, OS, used when somebody makes an excuse for why they lost their match, but what it actually refers to is a move in the game that is done that can cover both options of a mix-up. I'll link you guys to a video that Ryo did explaining exactly what an OS is and how you can use an OS to punish Robin's DP. As you can see, the meter burn back 3 will punish Robin whether he's meter burned his DP or not, meaning the back 3 is an option select and can cover both options the Robin player may choose to do. These types of concepts are not something I avidly look for. Other people, however, devote their time looking for tech like this in the game, and I personally am thankful for it. And last on our list, we have matchup knowledge. Another one of these that can only come through experience. 
A matchup is the evaluation of each character's options when two characters are in a match with one another. Each character in this game has 33 different matchups, creating over a thousand different matchups in this game. Matchups are given in a 1 to 10 number ratio depending on the character's chances of winning that matchup. 5-5 five five is an even matchup, 6-4 is a slightly winning matchup, and 7-3 is a bad matchup for that character, and so on. Nobody can know what every single matchup will look like in the game, but understanding which matchups your character excels at and which ones your character suffers in is important. It all comes down to knowing what your opponent can do as their character, and what you can do as your character to adapt to their playstyle. So now that we've covered general fundamentals in Injustice 2, we're going to go over tactics and playstyles that you'll see players go for. Now some people will tell you that you can play any character with any playstyle possible, and these people are fools. Some characters are hybrids between these tactics, but most of the time it is blatantly obvious what a character excels at doing, and how that character can be used most effectively. So let's get into it. There are five main tactics that can be observed in this game, and the first one we have is the Rushdown playstyle. A rushdown character is a close quarters combat character that wants to be in your face the whole game. They get most of their damage off of close up pressure, consisting of mix ups, staggers, and frame traps. We've already covered mix ups, and basically what you'll see from a rushdown character are the typical overhead low or cross up mix ups that require your blocking to be on point and your matchup knowledge to be present when blocking high or low against them. A stagger is any normal or string that is slightly negative or positive on block that is used to repeatedly loop the same mix up again and again. Deadshot used to have an iconic stagger, despite being a zoning character, consisting of his back 1 and back 1 2. His back 1 was slightly negative on block, <clears throat> meaning it wasn't able to be punished and could be barely beat out by a down 1. But back 1 2 hit low and then overhead, so instead of trying to press buttons after the back 1, it was much less risky to just wait for the second hit of the back 1 2, the overhead. And while you are waiting for the overhead, Deadshot can choose to stagger the back one by doing two back ones in a row, hitting low and then low again, opening up for a full combo. A stagger is essentially any string that can be repeated because you've conditioned your opponent into respecting the follow-up instead of starting their own offense. Deadshot had the ability to stagger his back one a few times and then go for his overhead starter forward two when people were expecting the next low back one instead of challenging his stagger. They would end up getting opened up by the overhead because they were respecting the follow-up to his stagger. And this type of offense is very rarely seen on a zoning character, which is why it was removed from Deadshot. Atrocitus and Superman have a series of frame traps they use. We've gone over both of these frame traps and studied the gaps between, and you've seen how they can loop the same mix-ups again and again. These three tactics play into a rushdown character's arsenal, and can be quite deadly if your opponent is unaware of the matchup. An example of rushdown characters in this game are Batman, Atrocitus, Flash, Black Canary, and Raiden. The next playstyle we find a lot more often in Injustice is the sort of space control slash defensive character archetype. These characters thrive off of their long range normals, their mobility, and their safety gimmicks. This playstyle is a lot less complicated and consists mostly of keeping your opponent in the range of your footsie normals, or canceling into specials that are safe on block. This playstyle gets its damage less off of mix-ups and more off of whiff punishing, small projectiles, chip damage, or other defensive tools. This playstyle covers a broad list of characters simply because of the ambiguity of the term defensive and space control. I could divide this list into footsie characters and aerial characters when I break down each character though. Either way, characters that endorse this playstyle are Superman, Wonder Woman, Supergirl, Aquaman, Grodd, Beetle, Ivy, Brainiac, Swamp Thing, Firestorm, Lantern, Adam, Scarecrow, Sub-Zero, and Robin. A lot of these characters are hybrid characters that appeal to a combination of the archetypes I'll be listing, so don't be outraged if you think that Superman is a rushdown character and not a defensive character. He's a hybrid of both. The next play styles I have here are the set play characters that get their damage off of traps and setups that can be very gimmicky or involve a mix-up of some sort. There are three main types of setups in Injustice 2. There are what I like to call the forced block setups, and these are seen on characters like Darkseid or Cyborg. A forced block setup usually begins with a sort of minion being summoned, something that moves separately from the character and hits mid against the opponent. This forces them to block the mid attack and has to hold whatever mix-up may be coming their way. For instance, Darkseid sends out his Parademon and teleports behind the opponent, preventing him from backdashing or anti-airing Darkseid because the Parademon will hit them. Now Darkseid can go for an unreactable 50-50 by doing a jumping normal that hits overhead or his low stomp move that hits low. Both lead to full combos. Darkseid is a very powerful character. 
The next type of setups are the cheesy hard to block setups, where a trap is laid out, allowing the character to follow up with a move that hits in the opposite direction, close enough to the same time as the trap. This causes some extremely hard to block mix ups, where you'll have to quickly transition from blocking standing into crouching, or vice versa, almost to a frame perfect level. These kinds of setups are seen by Red Hood and the Joker. Red Hood will throw a low hitting mine on knockdown and follow up with an overhead hitting gunshot from the air. If timed properly, the move can be a low overhead or an overhead low by just a 0.02 second difference. Pretty crazy, but this setup can be avoided by just delaying your wake up. So nothing too overpowered. And finally we have space control slash damage over time setups. These kinds of setups are utilized mostly by Captain Cold, but some other characters have them. What this setup is, is basically a way to control an area of the screen for a period of time, conditioning your opponent not to go into that territory. This kind of setup is the perfect way to slow down the pace of a match to the set player's advantage, and can sometimes wear down the timer of the match to a nerve-wracking level for the person that's being kept away. Set play characters include Captain Cold, Cyborg, Darkseid, the Joker, and Red Hood. Next we have the Grappler character archetype, which gets most of the damage off of small hits that do big damage. This damage is usually done through command grabs and standard throws that start to really add up. Full combos on these characters tend to do massive amounts of damage and are a force to be reckoned with. There's usually a heavy trade-off to using these characters, meaning that they either excel in one matchup or get completely destroyed in another matchup. Nonetheless, an important mix-up that comes along with using command grabs exists when a normal is blocked and cancelled into a command grab. This mix-up is called a tick throw. A tick throw occurs when a normal or string on block will cancel into a command grab and connect with that opponent despite having blocked the previous string. Bane is the character in the game with the most tick throws, and a large amount of his gameplay relies on them. As you can see here, back 1-1 one, one grab whiffs on hit, but back 1-1 one, one grab will connect on block, allowing Bane to meter burn the grab for some serious damage. A 50-50 exists in which if you try to escape by jumping, Bane can also drop an elbow instead of grabbing you, which will anti-air you and do some serious damage if meter burned. You can experiment in practice mode for all of Bane's tick throws. The biggest risk in doing these tick throws is that the grab part can be neutral jumped and punished on some characters like Supergirl for instance. Whiffing a command grab will almost always lead you to take damage for your mistake. The number of pure grappler characters in Injustice 2 is limited to just two characters with two others I would like to consider as grappler hybrids. Cheetah and Bane are the pure grappler characters, while Gorilla Grodd and Swamp Thing have elements of a grappler character. Our final character archetype and playstyle is the zoning character. These characters get their damage in by keeping the opponent as far away as possible by use of projectiles, other long range specials, and moves that will launch the opponent far away. A good zoner knows how to make hard reads and study the patterns of how you avoid his projectiles and adapt accordingly. There are multiple kinds of projectiles that each serve a different purpose. There are the high projectiles that aren't necessarily used for damage, but rather to slow the opponent's approach or punish their forward movement on the ground. There are the mid projectiles that are usually slower to travel, do bigger damage, or have other properties that will usually come with spending a bar of meter on a high projectile. There are angled projectiles which can be used on a read of the opponent's evasion of your high projectiles. Here we have Deadshot's Trick Shot, which covers multiple angles, or Harley's Projectile in the air that covers a downward angle, slowing a character's approach up close. Then we have projectiles like Green Lantern's Lantern Bomb or Starfire Star Bolts that will hit mid, but have to be inputted manually based upon the direction they're used at. Then finally we have Low Projectiles, which can be used to either push back the opponent, cover space to slow an approach, or to condition the opponent into jumping. Each have unique capabilities at keeping the opponent outside of their comfort zone. A common source of controversy arises from the difference between spamming and zoning. Allow me to distinguish. A spammer is a person who uses the same move back to back with no real idea of what they're doing or have any game plan in mind. A spammer will typically refuse to be conditioned and will continue to do the same move again and again until either they kill you with their shenanigans or die from being punished. A move does not have to be a projectile to be spammed. A zoner is a person who makes use of projectiles to keep the opponent as far away as possible. Zoning involves making proper reads and reactions and studying your opponent's patterns of approach. A good zoner will usually mix up these projectiles in order to assure maximum efficiency. It's a frustrating tactic to fight against, but if you're stuck at full screen against Deadshot doing this, you know you're doing something wrong. Because for every tool that a zoner has, a counter method around it exists. All you need to do is find it. Zoners in Injustice 2 can be seen in Dr. Fate, Deadshot, Harley Quinn, Green Arrow, and Starfire.
It's important for newer players to stay consistent with their playstyle. Attempting to play Black Canary after spending a month practicing Dr. Fate will result in a sort of unfamiliarity. Most professional players tend to stick within one archetype of character, with only the most elite few that can pick up any playstyle and play it to the fullest. Who needs a Kraken? Our final topic of discussion in this video will be interactables, inputted by the right bumper or R1. Interactables are a simple topic, but a powerful tool in certain matchups. These stage interactables have been implemented in NRS games since Injustice 1, where they have slowly been improved upon as more games release. Although some of them can be pretty glitchy sometimes, as seen in the Red Sun Prison here. Either way, glitchy or not, knowing your stage in Injustice 2 is just as important as knowing the matchup your opponent presents. The first thing to note is that not every character handles interactables in the same way. There are two main types of characters in regards to interactables. The power characters versus the gadget characters. A power character is usually seen in the big body type characters, but others like Green Lantern, Starfire, and Cheetah use these interactables similarly. A power character tends to use interactables more for damage or use as a projectile. Here in Arkham Asylum, the power character will swat his opponent with a corner interactable, whereas the gadget character would use this interactable differently. Gadget characters use interactables more for mobility and setup purposes rather than raw damage. Batman would vault off the same interactable corner that the power character would use as a weapon. Each type of interactable user possesses their advantages and disadvantages. It all depends on the type of interactable used. Most interactables when meter burned will give you two hits of armor, offering very good options to escape pressure, standing, or on wake up. Arguably the most useful interactables for gadget characters lie in the corner. In the corner, a power character will typically find an object to strike the opponent with, as seen in Arkham Asylum, while a gadget character will use the same interactable as a way to vault and escape, or vault and kick the opponent, by holding 3 after R1 is pressed. Another common corner interactable seen is the unblockable setup corner interactable. An unblockable bomb can be placed in some corners by holding down and R1. This bomb will launch the opponent and allow serious combo opportunity. Other various gadget interactables are present in the corner, as seen in Red Sun Prison, but these are miscellaneous and essentially provide a way to escape pressure. When mid-screen, interactables typically benefit the power characters more, whereas the gadget characters are usually limited to mobility options only. Power characters are given large projectiles that do heavy damage and gain a hit of armor when meter burned to combat any zoners from a distance. Gadget characters will usually leap off of these towards the opponent, providing a proper means of closing the gap or changing the path of a jump in order to mislead the opponent. Then we have the iconic background bounce interactables, which have the same effect for both character types. Getting caught during a background bounce interactable combo will more likely lead to a huge damage combo for a low cost of meter to your opponent. Be sure to familiarize yourself with any possible background bounce combos you could be experimenting with. Other interactables can function as throws, similar to the totem in the Quatan jungle in Mortal Kombat X. These interactables usually have a large hitbox in which the throws can connect, and could be meter burned allowing the throw to have a hit of armor. These interactables will vary in availability based on your status as a power or gadget character. Then we have stage transitions. Certain stages in this game are in two parts, and by performing a back three near one edge of the stage will transition you into the parallel of the selected stage. Because corner placement is something most characters strive for, the stage transition is rarely opted for, instead of substituting a forward 3 where a back 3 would go. At times, stage transitions can be useful to optimize the stage for a mid-screen character, close out a round, inflict unclashable damage, or inflict decent meterless damage. Either way, you'll occasionally take advantage of the stage transition, but not often. Unlike Injustice 1, most interactables can be blocked against, except for a select few. Here we see in Gotham City, a police car is an unblockable interactable for power characters. A little tip is to use the meter burn forward 3 to absorb the hit of the interactable, and full combo punish the user within the corner. Same goes for a corner escape, which can be armored through or air to aired. Overall, interactable shouldn't necessarily dictate your gameplay, but influence it. A good use of the stage can help any good player out of a pinch, and sometimes can be responsible for the win or loss of a match. Where there's a will, there's a win. Now that we've pretty much covered everything, you may be asking yourself, well, now what? And this is where I feel like so many tutorials fail, more than Injustice or MK or video game tutorials in general. They fail to give you any sort of direction on what to do with the information you just picked up on. So that's where I'll be going next. After watching this tutorial, my suggestion is to go to practice mode immediately. 
I implore you to try a new character after watching this video, unless you're sure of yourself that you have the characters you want. Knowing what you know now will open your eyes to so many things that character can do that you had no idea before. For those of you that have never played the game or have absolutely no idea what you're doing, then I suggest you try this out. Uh, try these five characters I have listed here. Try Superman, Green Arrow, Captain Cold, Green Lantern, and Atrocitus. Dabble in them. Don't get committed to any one just yet until you've tried them all. Each of these characters I've picked are easy to pick up, and they all excel in each of the different archetypes I mentioned in the tactics section. Don't pick Batman. Just don't. A lot of people tell you Batman's an easy character, but I I strongly suggest you do not pick Batman. I personally would suggest that you pick up a very high execution character like Flash or Poison Ivy or Gorilla Grodd before I suggest you pick up Batman. That's how bad Batman is. As a beginner, I find that so many people will get away with playing Batman and using his trait as a crutch. Batman's trait allows so many fundamentals to be completely useless because you have the trait out and it will cover your own hide instead of you actually playing the game. This may sound like a rant on Batman, but I'm being 100% serious. As Batman, you don't have to play footsies, you don't have to worry about gaps, you don't have to worry about any execution skills whatsoever, you don't have to master any sort of converting off of a stray hit, you don't have to worry about conditioning, none of it. These are some of the core fundamentals a beginner has to succeed at in a fighting game. And if you play Batman for every matchup, you're going to be screwed when you face somebody that outplays you with fundamentals rather than their character. Drop Batman if you don't have a solid grasp on the game. With that being said, once you've picked your character, stick to that character. Don't flirt with the cast as a beginner. That's one area I struggled with when picking up Injustice 1 and MKX. Commit to your character. Commit to your character so you can understand the more complicated capabilities he or she possesses, instead of all the surface level details. It's easy to spot a casual online when every time you beat them they'll switch to a new character and lose with that switch. Once you've learned everything you can possibly know about a character backwards and forwards, then I suggest you pick up a secondary. Your secondary character should serve the purpose of covering the matchups that your primary character struggles with, and that's it. After committing to a character, learn their BNB. In my future character breakdown videos, I'll be doing a few BNBs just to demonstrate how their conversions will work. Learn what each move is useful for, learn how to get their hits in, all that stuff. The best way to do this is to watch a professional player play the character. This is another bit of info I'll add onto my next series of character breakdowns, so keep your eyes open for those. After that, you should take on the hard AI for a bit, just to feel how the character performs in the neutral. Don't pick the very hard AI, because it'll read your inputs and that's not something you'll run into in a real match. Stick to the hard AI until you're comfortable with using that character in the game. The next best thing you can do is practice, 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 and that may seem very cliche, so let me elaborate. The only way you can truly get better at a fighting game is to lose. Failure is the best teacher. Getting mopped and understanding why you lost will be a moment you won't easily forget. About a year ago when I was playing MKX and didn't quite understand the finer points in the game, I remember playing against a Cassie Cage who kept abusing the plus frames off the back 124, plus frames that I neither understood or knew about. I got beaten again and again and again until this guy felt bad and broke the news to me. And I still remember never to poke after plus frames, because that's what killed me. My point is, find somebody who can beat you and tell you why you lost exactly. Then the last bit of advice I have, and one that you'll be doing perpetually, is learning your matchups. Find as many people as you can that play characters across the roster. With each matchup, you'll have to take a different approach as to playing the neutral and getting your damage in. So it's important to see how each character will try and play against you. You can't play against a professional Red Hood in the same way as a professional Flash. And at that point, just keep at it. Try entering tournaments, try expanding outside your comfort zone, or if you have an Xbox, make a tutorial on how to play the game because you have an Xbox and Xbox never gets any tournament action. Hopefully this section here was helpful in giving you guys an idea on where to start. That's all I got. And with that, I've met the end of my list of topics to cover. Hopefully everything here I presented was well understood, and any beginner to fighting games, or any beginner to Injustice 2 for that matter, can understand the game and enter the game more educated than most people are. I never really had that privilege and had to pick up on things as I went. So hopefully I was able to spare someone the time and lay out everything needed to know in order to take the game seriously. I know some parts aren't the most interesting for some, and I do hold deep appreciation for anyone who sat down and watched this till the end. As I'm watching this back myself, I'm realizing how similar it was to the previous guide I linked to you at the beginning of the video, the one about the MKX tutorial, and my intentions aren't to steal any kind of limelight for creating an in-depth tutorial. 
but rather to be as detailed as possible and to educate the new and experienced fighting game players who need a little more education on matters concerning Injustice 2. If this described you, and I've helped you understand a confusing concept better, or have allowed you to understand what you're getting into when taking Injustice seriously, then I've done my job and can rest easy. As stated earlier, this is not where I plan to stop. The moment I have this video published, I'll be creating an outline for my Batman character analysis video, and I'll do the entire cast and all future characters a full breakdown and analysis similar to this tutorial. If you guys have learned anything from this at all, I ask that you stick around for my next video. Remember, there is no knowledge that is not power, and I'll see you guys next time where I break down Batman. Batman.